Hello. Um, thank you for the, to the previous speakers, because I think you've actually done kind of quite a bit of framing for where this, what, what this actual project I'm going to talk to you about. And a lot of the final points that David made, I think you'll probably pick them up as we go through about some of the challenges and some of the benefits of running a project of this, a project around sustainable development, and particularly one that is not within the UK. Now, you're going to have to have a whistle-stop tour of stuff about Namibia, because not a lot of people in the UK know a lot about Namibia. It, we've, I've discovered. Oh, look at that. Sorry, just drifted across. So um, essentially, I ended up working in Namibia kind of by mistake. Um, Wales actually has something called Wales in Africa, where they fund people, for example, from CADU and other organizations to go and work in, um, in Africa on joint projects. And as a result of one of these um, initiatives, I was invited to go to, um, to Namibia, because um, a colleague of mine, Fionn Reynolds, who works for CADU, went there. And also, simultaneously, Cardiff University also has another project called the Phoenix Project, which actually works in Namibia, mostly de delivering um, medical training, training for medics, for doctors. It's then kind of ex um, actually expanded into social work and biological sciences and stuff. So it, we've actually got these kind of all these networks already built. So we went out for a scoping visit just before COVID. Well, about, about six months before COVID. Um, and we spoke to the people there about what they wanted. I went with one set of ideas about what we could offer. But when I actually asked them, they said they wanted something completely different. Um, but they said that was what they really, really wanted. And you'll see what it is they really want in a second. Um, and they wanted us basically to help them to manage. I mean, I think one of the final things Kate said was that, you know, you need good data. Good and the point is, in Namibia, people do not have good data about their heritage. So the, ver the, the most simplest thing we would imagine was the thing that they didn't have and they wanted us to give them, which actually turns out is an incredibly complex thing, and they didn't tell us lots of things. We didn't know what we didn't know, and neither did they, I guess. So we applied for funding. I think we ended up... I can't remember much money. They gave us some money. They took it away because of COVID. They gave it back again. I don't know, fifty thousand pounds or something like that. Was it less? I can't it remember. Less. It was less, less in the end. Yes. Um, a little bit of text at the bottom is just kind of saying this thing called GCRF is Global Challenge Research Funding. It does not exist anymore due to Brexit and all of those things and our, our disinvestment in various things. That funding is gone. So again, sustainability is a big issue. We kind of got halfway through a project that got hit by COVID and we haven't got to the end of it. So what are we supposed to do now? We have partners in another country looking at us, um, but we'll do a bit more about that. So but that's how kind of the money came. And basically Namibia has its own sustainable development goals, which is what I wrote to. But again, as I think Sarah said, heritage isn't actually a sustainable development goal. It's kind of, it's embedded in all sorts of other social, political, cultural values. So Namibia, where is it? What do you want to know about Namibia? It's huge. Having flown over Africa, I was like, this is a very big place, isn't it? I've never been there before. Anyway, so Namibia is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. It's got a very small population of 2.6 million people. It's mostly sub-Saharan Africa, which means it's a lot, a lot, lot, a lot of desert. You get kind of greener bits towards the top and towards the bottom as you head towards South Africa. And the top is then going to Angola. In between, there's a lot of desert, OK? Um, if you look at the official chronology, you might begin to spot some of the challenges we've been having thinking about um, archaeology in Namibia, okay? So this is the official chronology we asked them. So basically you go, you kind of, you skip right the way through. There's massive periods of time. Then you go Iron Age, early, middle, late, and then colonization, okay? So it, it's a kind of very, very broad sweep. This is the official chronology that they used. We asked them recently what they wanted to use. What happens is German colonization in 1884 and 1920, they became administered by South Africa and they gained independence in 1990. Hidden within that is quite a lot of crime, quite a lot of, of um, I suppose, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, the um, development of apartheid. You know, I mean, Namibia has had a very complex history. So I just, yes. So basically, it's kind of like after um, independence, they, be, they developed their own National Heritage Council. As of this day, there are only 137 sites on their National Heritage Record. That's natural and cultural sites. They merge them together. And that's both tangible and intangible heritage. 
This is a country that I can't remember, is like 50 times the size of Wales or more. And it's got a very small amount of cultural heritage on it. And three, <laughs> three of the regions aren't even on the national heritage record. And uh, so ultimately, a lot of the management is focused. They have a number of high profile World Heritage sites. So Twyfelfontein. So it's basically it's rock art. It's these big rock art sites. There's some stuff down kind of the skeleton coast. But ultimately, a lot of Namibian heritage is not actually clearly represented on its um, record or is, is even protected. Um, so then I guess one of the questions is what happens after Namibia's independence? Because the, the, the record began prior to independence. After independence, obviously, the Namibians looked at their um, heritage and decided that some things they wanted to change. So um, they actually moved some of the colonial monuments. So this, the monument that you can see of the chap on the horse, he's kind of like tied up at the moment. He used to actually be in front of one of the main buildings. Um, overnight, one night, he disappeared. A crane appeared and took him out and dropped him behind another building and he was never seen or heard of again. And ultimately, instead, they built this thing which is called the um, genocide statue. Okay, so there's old monuments go, some new monuments arrive. There's another site called Heroes Acre, and that's ultimately a site we'd like to do more work on, where they've buried all of the heroes from the Namibian independence. That mean, there's a lot, there's quite a lot to unpack in quite a lot of the actions that have been going on. But they also changed some of the names. So they have been going in and altering their, their kind of historic record. So um, Ludres became, and I'm not going to try and do the click language because I'm not very good at it. No, no, I'm not, no. Um, it's been renamed. Uh, if you go to our, our, our uh, website, there's actually, we've got a local telling us how to talk click language. And you can kind of do it, but I'm not going to embarrass myself, okay? So, but even though they were been renegotiating their heritage, there also, there was a lot of arguments about whether they should be doing this, how they should be doing this, um, and also, there's quite a lot of the new monumentalization is about new political powers. I don't know if any of you are aware of the giant statues to African leaders that are funded quite heavily by the Koreans all over Africa. I mean, again, go and look at it. It's amazing. So there's some astounding new monuments that have emerged that are kind of have a kind of attention, and some people like them, some people don't. So what's their big problem? So whilst we know all of these exciting things, you know, Namibia's heritage could contribute to social, political, economic, and ecological change, you know, it's very, very important, it should be celebrated, but what they do need is really good baseline data. I've already told you they don't have much on their baseline data. The deeper in we go to it, the worse it's kind of become. Ultimately, at the moment, the only one true source we have for the Namibian data is a gazetteer that was published. At the moment, the people we speak to within the National Heritage Council aren't entirely sure where their formal paper archive is because somebody moved it and they don't know where it is. There's all sorts of issues around where materials are. Um, Namibia is not a very rich country. It's not particularly well funded. They do get quite a lot of money to work with the World Heritage Sites, but not with other sites. So basically, a lot of their assets, both they're formally recognised, but also everything else is actually under-recognised, under-reported, and actually at risk. So, you th so what we got the conversation about was, you know, so, so where is the record of all of your sites? You know, what, what do you want to help with? And they said, well, that's our record. That's our record there. It's called um, Naris. And basically, it says page not found. So ultimately, what they did was they had a system built by the South Africans, which became defunct in 2016. Nobody in Namibia has the money nor their expertise to actually go into that and do anything with that data. This is the main route by which they manage applications, research, and management. Yeah, besides that, they're, they're kind of working on paper permits. But really, what they would like, as you would all imagine, would be a great big database with all of that material on and one that they could actually work with. So this is what they asked us to do, and this is what we, um, we, I, we suggested that we would help out with. So, I mean, obviously, our aims were to engage with both the... Um, University of Namibia, because our partnership is with the university. And that's partly to do with, there's only one university in Namibia that teaches, well, it doesn't teach archaeology, it teaches heritage, it has archaeology courses. We talk to those people, because they're the people who are training the new generation of Namibian archaeologists. A lot of them do tend to leave Namibia to gain their training and then return, but not many of them actually return to um, contribute to, I guess, to the education. NHC is the, National, is the Namibian Heritage Council, and we are working with the pair of them both to kind of create, to create this tool to develop and then to sustain it, really. And the idea is, if we know what's there, 
if we know what we've got, we can begin to move forward because at the moment it's actually really difficult to go anywhere. And obviously, one of our other aims is to train the people in the country to be able to use their own resources, to be able to use and manage their own resources. I think at this point, I didn't realize that the Nibian Heritage Council basically had two men and a dog in it. Um, we, we sort of thought there'd be more. Uh, so obviously, we all set it all up. It was exciting. We were going to go. It was all going to kick start. COVID starts, and we don't get to go. So we've been working remotely ever since then to try and actually run this project, which you can imagine has a whole series of challenges. At some points, it was really great because it was one of the things that kept you going, was our Friday meetings with the people in Namibia about the kind of the project. And we have made some progress towards it. But I mean, Scott will tell you a bit more about how we've tried to do this. And then at the end, um, you can I'll put in questions, ask us a bit more about when, how it hasn't really worked. So, you know, we're, try, we're basically trying to build a new data set for them. Do you want to talk? Oh. Quick. So, um, just touching on what Jackie said earlier, that Namibia is not really a very rich country, but it does have a lot of resources. And one of the big problems that we, we encountered when we started with this, um, and this goes back to the, the lack of record, is that the heritage assets that they've got in Namibia, they don't really know where many of them are. So they have got them on record, but they're kept on paper somewhere. They were published in a gazetteer or a journal, you know, X number of years ago. And the mining companies put in a lot of permits. So there's a lot of mineral extraction. There's a lot of diamond mining um, that goes on. And there's a lot of money in that business. And um, our colleagues in the NHC are constantly asked, is there any kind of heritage asset in this area where X mining company wants to, uh, wants to work. And they don't know, they can't answer that question. So we looked at the HEROS system, Historic Environment Records Open System, as being a potential HER that we could offer our colleagues in Namibia as a solution to this problem. So uh, the current system, NARIS, that Jackie pointed out earlier, uh, it's effectively is an online database. Um, it doesn't really go beyond that and nobody has logged into that except for, I think, myself since about 2016 um, and looked at the back end. It's not particularly usable, it's very cumbersome, and it doesn't really do what we would expect over here a heritage system to, to do. So we looked at Heros. We've got some uh, developers who work with us who are implementing the Heros system. Um, it's used uh, throughout Wales for Arquilio, which is the HER of Wales. Um, GGAT use uh, HEROS. There's a, a number of applications. South Gloucestershire uh, Council use the HEROS system. So it's widely used within the UK. It's a very big, robust heritage management system. And it works at different scales. So, you know, it's so a local, regional, and national there. One of the, one of the initial problems I, I think we encountered, which sort of confused us a little, was the, the scale at which Namibian heritage was looked at. It was generally looked at on a national scale, and there really wasn't anything else. I think that's fair to say. You know, but Jackie pointed out Twyfelfontein. Twyfelfontein is a huge site. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, that's the kind of level that uh, the Namibians are looking at their national heritage. So when I asked the question of uh, regional heritage or local investment in heritage, there, were, there was no real answer to that because um, regional, regional heritage wasn't really considered. So we kind of decided that the main thing they really needed to bring all of this together and to, to kind of make a granular heritage system was a GIS. Now, um, Aquilio, sorry, uh, Hero system uses uh, Inc GIS and this integrates into the data management system. Uh, we've got this in, we've got this running despite challenges on the uh, mapping in Namibia being a huge country, it's been pretty difficult. Um, but they now have access to this uh, GIS. And through that, if you look at the slide on the right hand side, we're able to have a public facing system where the mineral companies or archaeologists or researchers can now submit permits to ask for permission to actually work in certain areas. The data standards that we, that we have negotiated, agreed with our, with our colleagues in Namibia, I, I approach this um, using the fish thesaurus um, of English heritage uh, through Midas heritage. And it became quite apparent that our archaeology is not Namibian archaeology. And our culture is not Namibian culture. 
they view their archaeology far, far different than we do. Um, and I was approaching this from my Western perspective as a commercial archaeologist, and we were kind of meeting at different levels. We, we weren't communicating very well. And so I had to sort of step back and then understand the way that my colleagues in Namibia were approaching archaeology and how they viewed it. And we came to an agreement. Uh, we came to a, a system of categorizing it and some baseline data standards. We've applied that now. Um, and we've been running workshops for the best part of a year, I suppose, now. Um, so as Jackie said, we met on Fridays. You know, we'd have meetings. Um, our colleagues would come on board. Once that sort of drew to a natural conclusion, we started to run workshops where we get them involved, we show them the system, how it works, we're doing online training, um, we're trying to get feedback from them as to how they think the system is working, is it working for them, is it not, you know, what do they want differently. Um, and then on the back of that, we're looking at the training opportunities. So we've, we're hoping that we can train students at UNAM in the use of this system, because we're hoping it's going to be the main system for the National Heritage Council, and that in training students that they can then go on and work for the National Heritage Council. Um, so that sort of sustains that ongoing um, view of heritage and you know, the, the future of, of upcoming students and heritage officials and professionals. Uh, we don't know how we're going to do that yet. We've been looking at MOOCs. Um, it's going to be remote, however we do it, I think. But this is an ongoing part of the project that we are, we are refining over time. Um, so that just brings me to the end, really. I mean, these are the, the key stakeholders. And without these people pushing forwards and ourselves kind of pushing it, this, this really wouldn't have happened. But there are still a lot of challenges that we're facing. And I, and I think the biggest challenge really still for us is, is just kind of refining our understanding of Namibian heritage and, and how they view their heritage assets. I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say that I mean, one of our main aims is not to be, you know, kind of the Western white saviors who come over and say, here's this fantastic system, you know, why don't you use it? But we're trying, but they, but it's a kind of, it's an incremental process because their, their level of knowledge is very different to our level of knowledge about different aspects. And that just means that we're constantly having to negotiate sort of every single different aspect of kind of the process going forward, to be honest. I mean, everything from kind of the way, the, the terminology that we use to describe. There was one particular monument where, where Scott had rewritten the description describing the stonework as coarse. And it was a monument to a national hero. And, it didn't and, go down well. And they, I mean, yeah, they didn't, they were like, well, what, what, what do you mean it's coarse? We were like, well, it just means, you know, it's kind of loose, unmortared kind of rocks. And they were like, no, but that's a value judgment. You know, so I mean, there was all sorts of issues. I mean, and that's from right from the tiniest things. And one of the biggest issues, sorry, we will stop in a second, is that the, the records are written from a pre-colonial narrative. So everything that we're translating, some of the stuff, I had student volunteers helping, one of, one of whom started to rewrite the narratives because she went on Wikipedia and, and had a little look. And she was rewriting it, saying, well, you can't write this, because this is a monument to the German soldiers who were killed in the massacre where they actually ethnically cleansed the Hiroto. And it's a monument to them. And she said, you know, we have to change this. And I was like, no, you, can't, you cannot decolonize the Namibians. They, we have to do, if they want to rewrite their history, we have to do it in tandem with them. So basically, our job at the moment is to translate the record, is to move the records and create the thing. But then it'd be, the next stage might be to have a series of open conversations about are there other ways you'd like to rewrite your past? But again, because it all relates to national heritage, that then relates back to the national government. So it's actually much more kind of complicated and nuanced. It's, anyway. been, a, it's been a big learning process yes. for all of us, I think. But hopefully we're helping. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.